I'll continue on here with the uh, inner ear. <clears throat> So this is kind of showing you how it's associated inside the temporal bone. Uh, here's a picture. You're in the petrous region of the temporal bone. Get another pin here. writing it's inside the um, petrous region of temporal bone. Let's remember that the inner ear is associated with cranial nerve 8, the vestibular coat of the nerve, if you kind of dig out part of the petrous region where the cranial nerve is, right there, there's the internal cruciatus, and you can see the cochlea in that picture. I'm going to zoom in there. <coughs> On that image, do you see sets of three chambers? Sets of three, that's what I want you to see, sets of three. Here's one set of three. There's a chamber there, there, and there. And going, there's set of three, set of three, and on the other side, set of three. And these are all connected. This would be the cochlear part. That's the cochlear nerve, vestibular nerve. So there's different parts of that nerve. There's a cochlear part and a vestibular part. Let's kind of look at the whole inner ear structure shown here with the uh, cranial nerve coming right off of it. Um, basically, what you're seeing here, structure like that, and you're seeing this kind of structure here. The basic parts of um, the inner ear organ are the cochlea, that's for the sense of hearing, as hair cells for that. This middle part here is called the vestibule. Inside there is a structure called Within the vestibule is the utricle and saccule. You know, those structures are for the sense of like um, balance and equilibrium, particularly linear acceleration. from, you know, 30 to 70 in your car merging on the freeway, you feel that increase in acceleration in a linear direction. Now we have three semicircular canals in different planes of space, in three-dimensional space. And um, those contain a structure called the, the crista ampullaris. And those are good for, they're fluid filled, all these are. They're, they're good for sensing like a rotational acceleration. So those are the basic parts of the inner ear structure. 
And in all of these three parts, the cochlea, the vestibule, semicircular canals, all three of them, they have the hair cells. Hair cell. In here, in the utricle and saccule, there's hair cells. And then the semicircular canals at the base, I'll show you later, there's hair cells. So that, that's the cell I gotta talk about for all these different sensations. <coughs> On the slide it says, the inner ear, it's bony. So there's a bony labyrinth that surrounds a membranous labyrinth. Basically, what you got there. Now, if I could simplify this com complicated inner ear organ, um, well, let's look, go to the next slide. Bony labyrinth, membranous labyrinth. Um, look at the little thing on the lower left. If you could simplify the inner ear structure to a simple tube and then cut the tube and look at it, all you would have is like bone on the outside surrounded by another membrane-filled chamber, call that bone on the outside, call that membrane. The membrane, that membranous labyrinth, it, it's filled with an endolymph. is filled with a perilymph, another kind of fluid. Basically they're like they're like saline, filtrations of blood plasma. The point is they're fluid filled, there's different fluids. So the, it, within that inner ear, there's like bony membrane labyrinths. Um, okay, well let's talk about the different parts of the inner ear organ. Let's use this picture. <clears throat> let's look at it. There's no bone. Um, this is kind of like, well, there's, there's one of the auditory ossicles. Identify auditory ossicle. Which one was that? The stirrup. What do we call that? Stapes, pronounced stapes. That's pounding on the oval window, tilting it. It's all fluid filled here. Let's look at the cochlea. It's like a, you know, like a pastry. Let's unroll it and let's cut it right there. And look right there. I don't know if you can see in the back. See how there's three chambers in the cross section? Okay, we're gonna look at those three areas in cross section of a cochlea. Remember, we unwound the cochlea and cut it. Looking at it, this is what you see. This image here, see those three areas? Scale of vestibuli, cochlear duct, scale of tympani. So we're looking at the cochlea. So you just un unwound the, the cinnabon thing and just cut it, right? That's exactly what you did to get this view. So basically what you got here, cross section of the cochlea. You have um, different, different, um, scalas or ducts, these different areas. So I'll just kind of simulate what they got there. Uh, the top one is C 
scalar vestibuli. Also called the vestibular <coughs> duct. Now that's filled with a perilymph. I'll do the top and bottom first. Well, let's go in order. Okay, cochlear duct. Okay, that's the middle one, also called scala, um, scala media. Scala media or cochlear duct. That's filled with an endolymph. That, this one's important, the cochlear duct. It's got the hair cells. <clears throat> okay, well, the one on the bottom there, scala tympani. Scala tympani, and scala tympani also called um, tympanic duct. You know, at some point, I mean, not in this picture, but at some point in the cochlea, scala tympani is continuous with. Scala vestibuli. That being said, what fluid is it filled with? If it's continuous with it, it's filled with the same fluid, paralymph. Okay, well that's basically what you got there. And well, let's kind of look at the cochlear duct, scala media. Okay, so basically telling you the fluids it's filled with there. We're going to take a close look at the, uh, the organ of corti. This is the organ of hearing in scala, scala media. Now, they're on a membrane, <coughs> this floppy basilar membrane. So that membrane, part of the organ of cordy. Of course, you got the hair cells. There's like these outer ones and then these inner ones. The inner ones, I guess, are more important. They're, they basically transmit about 95% of hearing. Okay, something like that. That's what the books say. Those inner ones, well, they're all important. They all help in hearing, that's what you gotta know. They're covered on top with a very stiff tectorial membrane.
So know those membranes, know the hair cells. That's pretty much the organ accordion in my mind's eye. Two membranes, hair cells, like a hair cell sandwich. Okay, those are important. Organ accordion. Here's a nice picture of the hair cells, scanning electron microscopy. You've got about 3,500 inner hair cells, <coughs> the purple one on my drawing. Here's all the outer ones. Inner hair cells <coughs> transduce 95% of the sound, whereas um, the active movements of the outer hair cells that kind of amplify the signal, so they're important. Something like 16,000 of the outer hair cells. We're not seeing the whole cell. We're just seeing the hair. They're hairy in appearance. Okay, so let's kind of talk about how these hair cells work in the organ of Corny. First, let's review what I talked about before about sound wave energy, because it's going to deflect basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is less stiff. It's floppy to some extent, okay? So it can deflect. This one doesn't. So what's going to happen is you're going to def deflect a basilar membrane, and wherever you deflect it, it's going to move hair cells. And when the hair cells move, the hairs are stuck in the tectorial membrane above. If the cell is moving and the hair is stuck in the stiff membrane above, that's going to deflect the hair cell bundle. The deflection of the hair cell bundle will stimulate them to fire. That's what makes the cochlear nerve fire. And you hear, you perceive it as hearing, as sound. All right, so here's what I talked about earlier, right, about pitch discrimination versus amplitude and loudness. Um, you, have, you have a tuning fork. The waves, the sound, the molecules are making the air, the air well, you know, we live in air, okay, the, this you know. And well, anyways, the vibrations from the tuning fork or any sound are making the air particles move at a certain frequency. Right, and you can see that here. And um, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the pitch. I said this earlier. The, lo the longer the wavelength, low pitch, kind of bass, more bassy, less trebly. Loudness is simply the amplitude. Okay, so the blue, larger amplitude wave is, is perceived as being louder. So that's sound wave energy. And if we kind of map that out onto how it affects the, the cochlea. Here's a cochlea. Remember, cochlea is normally spiraled up. They, they unwound it here. Okay, so here's what we got, the whole cochlea. So let's look at this, not as a cross-sectional view, but as a longitudinal view. Okay. Here's my basilar membrane. I'll draw some hair cells on it. And the, the overlying membrane is a stiff tectorial membrane. my SM, my scala media, containing the hair cells. I mean, I'm not drawing it exactly anatomically correct, so don't roast me. Uh, but you get the idea. So if that's SM, what's, what's the topple? Scala vestibuli. 
yeah. And then ST, scale of tipping. So remember I said how scale of vestibuli is continuous with scale of timpani. See at the end? Things like that. So they are connected. Um, okay, the oval window is right there. So pretend this is a window that Stapes is hammering on. Here's the foot plate of Stapes. And you're going to kind of rock in, you're, you're going to push in. Now, this is filled with fluid, right? All three chambers. And basically, um, I don't know if you've ever like, been in a swimming pool, you're just kind of like looking at your friend there, and you're looking at each other, and you try to talk to each other. What does that sound like? I mean, it doesn't sound like anything, but the sound is very, you can hear clearly the mumbles underwater, right? Because a fluid medium transfers sound wave energy very good because it's more dense than air, okay? Like if you were to drop like a big 50 pound weight and it hits the bottom, you can hear it. You can hear it clearly. It sounds very different. And so this, this is kind of what's happening inside your inner ear structure. You're, you're pounding. It's like you push in here. Let's say you push it in, push in the window. Push in. If it's completely fluid filled, something's got to give. Okay? Um, so that's, a, there's another window here called the round window. Another window has to push out. The round window, I remember my professor called it, it's like a doormat. <clears throat> it's just something that absorbs the sound wave energy at the end. Okay, if you push in here and it's completely fill it filled, you got to push out there. Does that make sense? Okay, that's just, now you're pushing in and pushing out at a certain frequency. So you're not just pushing in once. It's like, it's like you ever twang a rubber band? It's like that. It's like, it's literally like that. Okay. Now the question is, so you got these windows. This energy starts here, okay? Because this is connected to the ossicular chain. Um, this is this is just the doormat. But this, when the sound wave energy goes in, depending on what the energy is. The thing I didn't mention yet is the basilar membrane, it's more stiff, closer to the windows, and it's like less stiff, <coughs> more floppy for the mouth. So if you were to look at the, the fiber lengths, um, usually how it's illustrated is like this. Exaggerate that more. Kind of like talking about the fiber lengths of the basilar membrane. Okay, basilar membrane on this end, it's more floppy. Physically, it's easier to bend if it's more floppy, the fibers are longer. If it's shorter and stiffer on this end, less floppy. more stiff, harder to move. The reason why that's important is, think about that, here's the question. Does it take more or less sound wave <coughs> energy to move on this end if it's more floppy? More or less energy? Less energy, okay? It takes more energy to move it here. The reason why that's important is you want to deflect the basilar membrane at a certain point. So let's say there's enough sound wave energy, let's say like that middle number there, 5,000 hertz. No, that's a six, 6,000 hertz. So let's say you're listening to something that's at that, at that pitch. This is pitch discrimination. These here are treble, these here are mid-range, these here are bass. And you're at some, I don't know, 6,000 hertz, that energy. It comes in, 
as soon as it comes in, it's going to try to deflect at the first part that it can, but it cannot. Not enough energy in 6,000 6, to deflect here. It's too stiff. So it just keeps going. And it deflects at the first part that gives, which is, I don't know, let's say it's here. Okay, so it deflects here. So this is the part that twangs. And you're moving those hair cells. Okay, and those hair cells, see where it kind of bends down? It deflects. Okay, and the sound wave energy just goes out. So it goes in and out at a certain frequency, like boom, like that, okay, depending on how much. So that's why this design is important because you only want to stimulate the hair cells for a particular pitch. You're not stimulating these, you can't. If you did, you would hear trouble, okay? So you only hear one pitch at a time, right? You only have energy for this one. Let me show you something here. Oh, here's a free online hearing test. Let's listen to a tone. Do you guys hear that? That's 1,000. So 1,000 is like way down here. That's what 1,000 sounds like. You're stimulating hair cells over here. Let me turn that down. Okay, that's 2,000. Is that more or less energy? Is 2,000 more or less energy than 1,000? 1,000, 2,000. What has more energy? 2,000. 2,000 has more energy. So that sound is traveling less far. Okay, maybe 1,000 went down to here. Where is 2,000 going to go and deflect? Sooner, maybe here. Maybe deflect here. So the hair, hair cells that would be here in your ear, are, and you hear this one tone. Okay, 1000 was different. Okay, that's 3000. All right, so where are you stimulating now? More to the left or more to the right? More to the left. All right, a higher pitch is now I can deflect the stiffer ones. I deflect at the first place I can. That's 4,000. So you hear that? So here's 4,000. Okay, this, is, this was like, I don't know, 3,000. At this location. Is 4,000 deflecting more to the left or more to the right? More to the left, right? Correct? More there. Okay, so I deflect at the first place. Am I deflecting here? No, it's too stiff. Am I deflecting over here? No, I've already deflected here. You only deflect for one pitch at one place. Okay. All right, so you passed the hearing test if you heard all those tones. Um, so, so that's kind of the design of that's why this is important because you deflect at the first place you can it's only going to be one location what if it was the reverse you would deflect at every location and you would hear all the pitches at the same time for every sound and that wouldn't work uh, let me go back to this so okay let me ask another question I'm, I'm going to raise this What if the sound wave travels like this? Travels in, doesn't deflect here, travels in, no, not enough energy, travels in, no, travels here, no, it doesn't deflect there, we just know it goes right out. What do you hear? Nothing. 
You have to st stimulate any hair cells, so maybe it's outside of your range of hearing. Okay, yeah. So, say you listen to classical music and you have all kinds of instruments with different types of pitches. Yeah. Um, how does that work? You, you, hear, you, you hear multiples. My, my demonstration was one pitch, right? So you can do multiples. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can look up uh, Google, like, pictures of this organ listening to classical music, and they're all going at the same time. If you hear, if there's two pitches, two will deflect. Okay. Yeah, so it's just, like, whatever you're hearing, <clears throat> yeah, there's that old thing, um, what's the thing, if, if a tree falls in the forest, but no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? What's the answer? Yes, it made the sound waves, there's, there's, there's no hair cell to receive it. It made a sound. That's a silly question, you should set up a video camera there. <laughs> but I don't know, I'm, you need you need the hair cell. <laughs> Okay, so here's that um, thing. Here's the fibers of the basilar membrane. These are the longer ones. They're floppier. The hair cells that are here, what do they sense? Treble or bass? Base. The base. The ones that are more stiff need more energy to deflect them. That, that's the treble. So here's high frequency. You deflect it sooner. Mid-range, bass down here. If it went all the way around, you wouldn't hear anything. Okay, identify this scala. Media, scala media. What's the top one? Scala vestibuli. What's the bottom one? Scala tympani. Good, starting to click. What window is under the foot plate of stapes? There's round and oval. Which one is it? Oval. Oval. Remember that. That's the that's the one oval window. Okay, so here's kind of another picture of the same thing, showing you the whole ossicular chain with the cochlea. Let's talk about the vestibular apparatus. So that was hearing, that was pitch discrimination. We're going to do um, balance and equilibrium. Okay, the vestibular apparatus, here's a diagram to help us through it. I drew it out before. It's the utricle and the saccule, um, since linear acceleration, it's already in your notes, but here's what we're looking at. You have to go inside the vestibule to see the U and the S, the utricle, saccule. The M is the sense organ with what kind of cell? Hair cell, those are the ones. <coughs> Macula's got it. There's a picture of what macula looks like inside the vestibule. Um, yeah. What you got here are hair cells. And the hair bundle is kind of within this otolithic membrane with otoliths. Oto means like stones, right? Little, little tiny rock crystals in your ear. So what you got are hair cells. hair bundles embedded in an oto with membrane. Otoliths are tiny rock crystals, calcium carbonate or something like that. crystals in your ear, they move inside your head. And when they move, they move that membrane and stimulate the hair cells. Move with head movements.
and that stimulates the hair cells. I've been told, because I never experienced zero G, that astronauts, when you have zero G, well, there's no gravity. So what happens to those rock crystals? They float. You perceive that as, well, you just get nauseous. Eventually, you adapt and get used to it, but. Okay. Has anyone ever experienced zero G? Nobody? It's like on my bucket list. Experience zero G. What is that like? <clears throat> okay, well, okay, let's, so we got, oh, okay, let's talk about the semicircular canals. Um, the semicircular canals, what you got here, if I, if I were to draw one of these, what you're looking at is, you have three of them, for like <coughs> X, Y, Z, planes of three-dimensional space. Let me just draw one. Semicircular canal. much like that. That's one semicircular canal. Um, at the base is the ampulla, and that has the sense organ called the crista ampullaris. Crista ampullaris has the hair cell. Okay. Um, now, because that canal is a semicircle and there's fluid in it, <clears throat> pretty much you can only stimulate the hair cells which are in here when the fluid moves. So you can only move that fluid if it's in a circle, if you spin around in a circle. Okay, this is not linear acceleration. This senses the rotational acceleration. Here's what it looks like in the base in the ampulla. So what you've got there is cupula with hair cells. The crista ampullaris is the row of cells that have the hair cells in it hooked up to cranial nerve 8. Uh, the cupula is kind of like, uh, reminds me of a lava lamp. It's just a gelatinous structure that will, when it moves, the hair cells move with it to give you a sense of rotational acceleration. This, this is one, this is why I know I cannot be an astronaut. I cannot handle this. I go on like a merry-go-round or the teacups. I, I want to get off. I'm going to puke. I can't, I don't know why I can't handle it. I have such a wimp when it comes to those kind of little kiddie rides. I can handle roller coasters, no problem. The linear acceleration. But this one, I, I lose my mind. And I try to hide it from my kids. Only you guys know. They don't know what petrifies me to this rotational acceleration. But this is what we're talking about here. So there's the hair cell. Let's talk about um, the hair cells, the, the hairs themselves. Every time I think I'm tough enough to be a fighter pilot or an astronaut to get on a ride, I realize I can't do it. Bodies are subjected to remarkable g-forces to be able to handle a lot without passing out. Um, okay, the big hair cell is called the kinocilium. That's important. All the smaller ones um, next to it are just stereocilia. And um, it's a stimulation of this hair bundle that will. Someone have the phone? Okay. Someone. Um, <clears throat> well, they, researchers have been studying this hair bundle. Look at the picture here.
Identify that. Kinocilium. No. Looks like a dandelion. Okay, but that whole thing is the hair bundle. Uh, some of the researchers that researchers that have looked at the, the hair bundles or the mechanotransduction of the hair cells, or Husbeth and Corey, this work was done in the 70s, they found that the, the hair bundle is directional sensitive. Okay? That if you move it in one way or the other, you cause a depolarization or hyperpolarization. Okay. And what they found was, well, they worked with um, the saccule of um, a bullfrog. What they did was they removed the otolithic membrane and exposed the hair cells to their glass electrodes. Okay. And if they move in one direction toward the kinocilium, it depolarizes the cell. Move away from it, hyperpolarize. The directional sensitive. So hair bundles are directional sensitive. Um, so if you move. in this direction, wiggle it this way um, toward the kinocilium that tends to cause a dipole. If you move it the other way, it causes a hyperpolarization. It's directional sensitive. You can look at the data slide if you want. It's the basic idea. Now the reason is, I haven't been drawn it this way, but they think that the tips of the hairs are linked with proteinous structures. And so this is called the tip links hypothesis, that there's literally something connecting the tips of the hair cells. Okay. So they're connected. So the hypothesis is, tip links hypothesis is, if you move toward the direction of the big hair, the kinocilium, you stretch the tip links, that causes the excitation. And if you're moving it the other way, when the tip links are slackened, that causes the inhibition. Okay, so that's, that's the hypothesis. <coughs> So this depolarization, tip links, stretch, tip links, slacken, the stretch is causing the excitation, the other one's inhibition. cells, the hair bundle, directional sensitive. So for example, here's a picture of um, the otolithic membrane. If you tilt your head one way versus the other way, you get a dipole hyperpolarization. Um, they show a picture of an otolithic <coughs> sliding across the hair cell bundle to stimulate it. Okay. The other one, that, that's for linear acceleration. This is a semicircular canal. Look at the figure skater. So obviously, what kind of acceleration is that? When you spin, middle frame, then stop spinning. Um, you know, the fluid, like for example, um, when you spin, then stop, like, you know, fluid has an inertia. So if I move my water bottle that way, the fluid inside swishes when I stop, when I decelerate, okay? So inside the semicircular canal, when you stop spinning around in a circle, when you're ice skating, the fluid inside will then deflect. Okay? As you're spinning, of course, you sense that. It'll move it one way, and then when you stop, it moves it the other way. 
and this is, well, you know what that feels like. Spin around in your chair and stop, okay? And it doesn't matter which way you spin left or right. No. It's just going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah, they just simulate different air cells. Um, so this is why this is called balance and equilibrium. You ever do that? We always do that at parties at barbecues where you put your hand on the knob and a baseball bat and you spin around a bunch of times. Do you ever play that? And you try to run straight and it's hilarious because you can't do it. You just run off to the side because your balance and equilibrium is whacked out. Okay, you just overstimulated it. Um, all right, that concludes the last slide of your last lecture at 430. Good job for sitting through that. Give yourself a hand because you got some tests to take. Um, so um, you know we're done. And you can stay here and study. Um, I'm here to help you. But the next thing we got are two dissections. Before you leave, if you're going to leave, what what is the start time for our dissections on Monday? Eight o'clock. Okay, we'll start a little later. Give me time to set up and be dressed for lab. Remember, eye protection and gloves for these dissections. Um, I'll see you then. And did you say we'll probably be done by like 10? Um, oh, let me see. Let's stop this.